the Sunday School Lesson Review. Welcome to the Sunday School Lesson Review hosted by the pastor of New Bethel Baptist Church, Brother Lars Jordan. The subject of this week's lesson is, Worshiping in God's Temple. The scripture reading is coming from 2 Chronicles 7 chapter, verses 1 through 9. Please, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. After you click the subscribe button, make sure you click the notification bell for future lessons. I'm Brother Lars Jordan, pastor of the New Bethel Baptist Church, located at 2729 Oak Grove Road in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. And today our Sunday school lesson for March the 18th, 2018 is The People Gave Thanks to God. The international topic are worshiping in God's temple. And another topic would be finding inspiration. But our lesson today is taken from Second Chronicles, the seventh chapter, verses one through nine for our printed text, but verses one through eleven as our background scripture. And our lesson today, we're still dealing with this area of, of topic, our area of study called acknowledging God. And our immediate topic is follow in my ways. And when we find this acknowledging God, uh, recognizing who he really is, understanding that he is the supreme authority over everything, the maker and creator of our universe. So it's not just saying that he is someone that did this, but recognizing that he is over all and he has this unlimited creation that he is reigning over and will always be. He is our forever God. Our lesson last week, we, we have been going through this dedication of the temples. Uh, we, we call this Solomon's temple, but we find that his father David had got the articles together, but he was told that he could not be the one to build the temple because of the blood that was on his hand, King David, but God did allow him to make ready these things for his son to be able to build a temple. This was such an awesome experience that on different occasions, the glory of the Lord showed up. And when the glory of the Lord showed up, he was the one that performed the operations that had to happen because the, the priest could not go into certain areas when the glory of the Lord would show up. So they could not perform their duties there at the end of the fifth chapter. And now we'll see it again in our lesson today. But we, we go into this area of worshiping God to worship. We, we find that Jesus had a discussion about, about worship with a, with a lady one day there in, in John, the fourth chapter. And the, the end result of that, he told, the, he told this, this young lady that, that there will come a day. And the day is now when those that worship God, because God is a spirit, I believe the 24th verse of that fourth chapter of John, God is the spirit and those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. That is the only way that these people found themselves this day, the, the day of dedication and the day that Solomon had prayed and, and, and this feast that was going on at this time, this, this, the celebration that was happening here in the month. Tishri, where, where they were celebrating these feasts at this time. And the Day of Atonement came in between all of this. So this was a special time for the people of Israel. But worship, when, when Jesus talked to that lady, she was more concerned about Jacob's well, well that she was drawing water from. And Jesus was telling her that I, if you were recognizing who you were with, I would give you living water. And when she understood that, she did want that water. And But worship, 
to worship God. Worship is a humble and reverent adoration given with total honor and respect to our sovereign authority, which is God. Just something that, 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 that we, we, we decided to write about worship because that's the way that worship should be. It is the humble and reverential, uh, total respect. We call it fear in the Bible, but it's not scared, but it's total respect reverential adoration, adoring who God is, and given in total honor, just honoring him and everything in us and respect to our sovereign, our sovereign supreme authority, which is God. And when we talk about worship, there are many ways to, to or de, uh, diverse ways or different ways to, to worship. But some of the ways that, that we worship, some of them are shown here in our lesson today. But one, there is the public respect shown by bowing the head or laying prostrate before the Lord. It, as, as others will see us humbling ourselves before the Lord, that would be the public worship. And, and, and then there is the broken and contrite heart that really worship David talked about in the 51st number of Psalms when that heart is lifted up to heaven, realizing our imperfections, knowing that we are standing before a perfect God. And then there is the one that we know most about, the we attend service, worship service, we call it sometimes on Sunday morning or Wednesday evening. And we, at that worship service, we, we, we humble ourselves, but we learn more and more about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He said, learn of me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The reason that we learn of him is because after we have be gotten saved, we go out and bring others out of the darkness into the marvelous light. And then there is the, the maybe one of the most important of all the ways that we worship is sacrifice. We'll see that in our lesson today, but the ultimate sacrifice, the, the, the people of God, when, when, when the sacrifice, giving of oneself, the Apostle Paul talked about it in the third chapter of, of Romans, verse 25, when he said that Jesus is our propitiation. In other words, our ultimate sacrifice for the sins of man. We, we need our sins washed away, and, and when the sacrifice is made, the Lord can work with our hearts in a true and real way. And, and the Apostle Paul also talked about that again there in, in the, the 12th chapter of Romans, where he said we ought to, uh, he, when he said, I beseech ye therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. But, I, but our lesson today goes into the people giving thanks to God because of what was going on, what they were seeing, not just what he had done, but because of who he is, acknowledging him for who he is, the supreme authority. At, at the end of our, our uh, the chapter 6, where, where Solomon had been praying, and he said, the, verse 39 said, Then hear thou from heaven, even from the swelling, dwelling place, their prayer and their supplication, and maintain their cause, and give thy people which have sinned against thee. Forgive thy people which have sinned against thee. Now, my God, let, I beseech thee, thine eyes be open, and let thine ears be attended to the prayer that is made in this place, this temple that, that the Lord had allowed him to build. Now, therefore, arise, O Lord God, unto thy resting place, or the place where you are saying that you are dwelling with your people, Israel, here as the ark of the covenant. He said, Thou and the ark of thy strength, let thy priests, O Lord God, be clothed with salvation, and let thy saints rejoice in goodness. O Lord God, turn not away thy, the face of thine anointed. Remember the mercies of David, thy servant. And then we go into 
the seventh chapter, our printed text. The chapters were not there when, when these things were originally written, but they were put, it, put in there for us right now. So he said here in the, in the first verse of the seventh chapter, he said, now when Solomon had made an end of praying, when Solomon finished praying, the fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices and the glory of the Lord filled the house. Now, we have seen instances in the Bible where fire had came down. One of the, the, the greatest and dramatic instances was there when, when Elijah was, was in this contest with the prophets of Baal and, and the fire came down from heaven and consumed the, the burnt sacrifice and the, and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water and, and, and that was in the trench and all of those things that were just dramatic there. But there were other occasions where the fire had came down from heaven, even when when Gideon was was called into the ministry there in Judges. So we know we know that these things happened, but it was dramatic. Even when the tabernacle was established, God showed his presence. And that's what the important thing about this. When Solomon made an end of praying, it was to at this point we was trying to see if God accepted the dedication of this building. Would he accept this building? He had, had, had let it be built. He had told David that, he, that his son was going to do it. He said, David, when you're off the scene that, that, and, and you're sleeping with your fathers, he said, I'll raise up your seed and establish his kingdom. He'll have a kingdom and I'll build me a house and he shall rather build me a house there in first Chronicles chapter 17 verses 11 and 12. He shall build me a house and I will establish his throne forever, which would be the throne of David that would be established forever. And God speaking prophetic there about Jesus Christ also. Now, Solomon had finished praying. So now we see that God did accept the temple, and the king. Those were the two things that, that David was promised there in the, the 17th chapter of First Chronicles 11 and 12 verse. He was promised that he would establish his son as the king and he would accept the temple. So he did that. And when the, when the acceptance came, it came in the form of fire coming out of heaven. We know that God is a consuming fire, but he is a consuming fire that is under control. And fire usually speaks of judgment, but here it speaks of acceptance. God purifying this temple and hollowing this, this, this man that he had established in his father's place as the king and consume the burnt offering, didn't just burn it, but consume the burnt offering and the sacrifices and the glory of the Lord filled the house. The Shekinah glory took over the building that they were in. And look what, it, what happened. Again, we see this happen. In, in verse two, it says, the priest could not enter into the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the house, the, the Lord's house. Now, this was not because these were dangerous carthagens in the house that would, would mess up the lungs or, or something like that. But I imagine these priests were standing in awe of the glory of the Lord and the brilliance of the glory of the Lord. They couldn't go in. The light would uh, would have probably killed them. So they were probably just standing just like everyone else in total adoration of what was going on. This humble, reverential adoration that we talked about. At this point, they were in a spontaneous worship of God because of what was happening at that time right there in front of them. The priest could not enter. They couldn't go in. Even if they would have went in, it, it would have consumed them because of the brilliance of the light of the glory of the Lord, the Shekinah glory of the Lord, God's presence being manifested in this place at this time. We, we know that when 
when it's really established, when everything gets going, it would be like it was in the tabernacle. It would it would be where it would only be one person that could go in to that place. Remember, this is during this time. This is this month. This is the seventh month. This is this is at that time when the, the day of atonement would happen, when that priest would go in to the Holy of Holies with the blood of the of the scapegoat and sprinkle it on the mercy seat that that lid that was over the box, which was called the Ark of the Covenant, and he would sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat, and the people's sins would be forgiven for one year, and then they would have to do it again. It happened that this was the time that this was going on the 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 day of atonement the the atonement day would happen 5 days before the feast of tabernacle so here the glory of the lord had filled the house the radiance the brilliance of god filled the house and the priests couldn't go in and perform anything they i'm sure they just stood there in awe just as we would be if we were able to experience such a thing and when all the children of Israel, now note that that all is the same in the Greek and the Hebrew. When it says all there, it's talking about all. All the children of Israel saw how the fire came down. They were all witnesses of what was going on at this time. Now, when a person is a witness of something, maybe they'll never turn back to sin again. But remember that even during the time of atonement, every year after people that experienced different things, every year they would have to come back and ask for forgiveness again, bring us another sacrifice to the altar so that it can be offered to get rid of their sins a another time. But here, all the children of Israel, they saw this with their own eyes as the fire came down from heaven. It had to be an awesome experience. It came down from heaven and the glory of the Lord upon the house. They were able to see some, somewhat this radiance, this brilliance, this brilliant light set up on this house, this, this building that was set up and established for God's presence with his people. So they bowed themselves with their faces to the ground. Now, they bow themselves. Now they're 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 laying almost prostrate. They they bow down more than likely on their knees and they put their faces to the ground. Some may have laid all the way down, but look at who did this. How did this particular sinner start out? This particular verse start out. It said all the people. All the people saw this and all the people it, it spontaneously got down on their knees with their faces to the ground or on the pavement and worshiped. They fell into this humble adoration, giving total honor and respect to the sovereign, to the supreme authority, acknowledging God as our overarching topic would say. They were acknowledging God at this time. They worshiped him and not just worshiped him at this time. Some semblance of praise began to burst forth from their lips. Maybe it was when they were down on their 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 fate with their faces to the ground that something kept, began to flow from their lips as they they just thank God for all that He's done and all and, and for who He is. They and worship and praised the Lord, saying, "This definitely did come from their lips. This was a part of their praise right here, and this would be that." That thing that we would find that would come out antiphonal. Or one side may say it and then the other side may shout it back. And we, we find that it, it is written there in some of the scriptures about the, this, this antiphonal type of, of chanting and worshiping God, praising him in a certain type way. They may have praised him with other words, but definitely these words right here. We see that some of them in our in our Bible are in italics, so it may not be just these particular words, but we know it was something like this, for his mercy endures forever. He is good for his mercy endure forever. They said about the Lord, and for he is good. Is he good? 
God is good. Not just good like we, we, we eat food and it's, it tastes good to us. But God is the ultimate and essence of good. James even proclaimed that every good and perfect gifts comes down from above. God is the, the orchestrator of good. If there is any good about it, it came from God. David even made this declaration. He even told you to taste, uh, not just like you would taste a, a piece of good cake. He said in, in the 34th number of Psalms, verse 8, he said, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusted in him. Taste and see that the Lord is good is what, what David said there. So these people, laying with their faces to the ground, praising the Lord in some type of way, but still even these words coming out of their mouth say, for he is good and his mercy endureth forever. How long does his mercy last? How long is his mercy? What is his mercy? His mercy is his loving kindness. His mercy is his compassion. He, these people here at this time of atonement at this time will find that God is the same forgiving God that, that Solomon had just asked for when these people came. Would you forgive them, God, as we ended the read the end of the sixth chapter just before we got started? See, so... Now, God is, shows his loving kindness. How long does he show his loving kindness? When will his loving kindness stop? It says it endures forever. We cannot put to forever in our minds in reality. We can only put forever in time because we're living in time. Time is the only thing that we have experienced. But when we think about it in the spiritual sense, God has always been and he is forever. Even though we can't put all that together, that's how long his loving kindness or his mercy will last toward his people. It's unending love. This love will never end. Now, that this particular phrase, for his mercy endure forever, is mentioned about 40 times in this Old Testament. It says, verse 4 says, Then the king and all the people offer sacrifices before the Lord. The people offer sacrifices. Now, they brought sacrifices, giving things to, to be sacrificed, animals to be sacrificed at this time. But as we told you earlier, we're told to bring ourselves. The Apostle Paul said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy and acceptable, knowing that God is the one that makes you holy. He is the one that hollows you. He's the one that consecrates you. He's the one that sets you apart as you make yourself available to him to be used by him as the vessels in the temple were used only for temple worship. God will use you to build up the kingdom, edify the saints. It says, verse five says, and King Solomon offered a sacrifice of 20 and 2,000 oxen, 22,000 oxen. This would seem like a lot, but in the earlier verses, in the, in, as this was going on here, this dedication was going on, there were animals killed, and that was too innumerable to, to number. But here we do have a number, and it is an exuberant number to us, it seems like, but it was something that was able to be done. So 22,000 oxen, or bulls, and 120,000 sheep were were brought as a sacrifice by the king here for this. So the king and all the people dedicated the house of God, not just Solomon. He didn't do this alone. The king and all the people dedicated the house of God. They made this cer ceremony happen here as they were were celebrating the opening or the grand opening of this building that God had accepted along with the king that God had established because of a promise he made to King David. Now, verse, verse 6 says, And the priests waited on their offices, the Levites also, with instruments of music of the Lord, which David the king had made to praise the Lord because 
his mercy endureth forever. Made the to praise the Lord because the Lord's mercy endures forever. When David praised by their ministry and the priests sounded trumpets before them and all Israel stood. Here, the priests are ready to perform their duties. They're waiting. They stood at their posts or their assigned position. This is where I'm supposed to be. They were there at their assigned position. Maybe at this time, because the priests and the Levites, they were, the some of them were the musicians. They were the ones that played the trumpets. They were the ones that, that may have done these antiphonal chants, one to another, one shouting from this side, one shouting back from that side, and the priests waited on their offices and, and the instruments were being played. The important thing, look at the, what the instruments. These instruments were some of them were made by King David. David, the 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 sweet psalmist, the person that that loved music himself, that felt like music should be a part of worship. Music should be a part of praise. There are some that are afraid today of using musical instruments to praise God, but we should use whatever God has given us to give praise to him. And they use these instruments uh, to praise God. And because his mercy endure forever, his loving kindness endure forever, his loving kindness is an unending love, an unending love and compassion. When David praised by their ministry and the priest sounded the trumpet before them, and look at the last thing that is said there in verse 6. All Israel stood. Remember, now all of them laid down before the Lord. But now the priests are set in their place. They were standing at their post. They were, they were standing at their assigned position. Now everybody is, is trying, to, trying to shake it off and get back to where they, they need to be. And now all of Israel stood as the trumpets were were sounded here at this time and the music may be, have been going over antiphonally at this time and then verse 7 says moreover solomon hollowed the middle of the court that was before the house of the lord for there he offered burnt offerings and the fat of the peace offering because the brazen altar which solomon had made was not able to receive the burnt offering and the meat offering and the fat. Now, several different offers of offerings are made here. But it says here, moreover, Solomon hollowed or consecrated the middle court, the place that was not set up for the, these particular sacrifices. But because there were so many sacrifices, the king made provisions so that they could be performed in these 14 days that they would have to do, get all of this done because of these two feasts that were happening at this time within the midst of this, the Day of Atonement going on during this, this, this Feast of Tabernacles and, and everyone trying to perform the duties that they were supposed to perform. So he, he consecrated the, the, the middle court of the, the tabernacle or the temple area there. There was a brazen altar. But and Solomon did did make it bigger. It was amplified above that one which was for the tabernacle, but it was still too small for all that was going on at this time with twenty two thousand oxen and a hundred and twenty thousand sheep and whatever the people might have brought also for an offering and a, and a sacrifice. So he hollowed that. He, he, he consecrated the middle court. He set that apart for the service of God at that time in that special way because what he had would have still been too small. So he made preparation. The burnt offering in, in Leviticus chapter 1 lets us know that it is the sin offering and a, a male uh, lamb was brought in unblemished and without defect it, and it was dedicated to the Lord. Now that particular offering was burnt whole. The whole thing was burnt 
to crisp and, and nothing would be left of it. And then there was the meat offering, which would be flour or grain offering that was offered before the Lord. And, and it symbolized the thanksgiving for all the things that God had done and was doing, even with the grain, giving them something to, to, to sustain themselves from time to time to this year again. All of these things happening at the Feast of Tabernacle and, and, and now... They're giving thanks what a what a meat offering is is said here, and then there's the peace offering, and before the peace offering is said, it talks about the the fat there, the 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 fat, the, the meat offering, then the fat, which is talking about the peace peace offering there at the end of the seventh verse there, and and the fat is mentioned there particularly because this would be the sacrifice. The, the one sacrifice that the people could partake in. They could eat some of the peace offering. Some of it was theirs. They could eat some of it. The people and the priests could sustain themselves with part of the peace offering, but not the fat. The fat was given totally to the Lord. That was given to the Lord, and it would be the sweet-smelling savor in the nostrils of the Lord. All of these things happened there, the peace offering. Also, the same time, Solomon kept the feast seven days, and all Israel with him, a very great congregation, from the entering in of Hamad to the river Egypt. From the beginning, from the start of what, this was the, the amplified area of Israel during the reign of Solomon and David. Those were the biggest times of Israel. And and from, from the top to the bottom is what it's saying there. And within these seven days, all of these sacrifices are made. And in the eighth day, they made a solemn assembly. Everyone came together with a solemn assembly for they kept the dedication of the altar seven days and the feast seven days. They honored the Lord as they dedicated. They worshiped the Lord. The people gave thanks to God at this time, acknowledging their supreme authority. Father God, we do thank you today for the study of your word. And Father, we pray that this word will simmer on our hearts and minds and give us a fuller understanding of how you want us to present ourselves a living sacrifice. Father, we do pray that you will search our hearts, forgive us of sin. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining the Sunday School Lesson Review. Hope to see you next week. God bless you all.